All right, good morning. So I told you I would give you some time to finish this up. Today there will be a drop box available for your group critical thinking answer. So we are going to uh, let you do this, finish this. I'll give you about 15 minutes to finish up at least what you want to discuss. If you want to change your answers after that, you'll have until midnight tonight to submit your group, to have one member of your group uh, submit it to the drop box for uh, the grade for the critical thinking challenge. I have the critical thinking challenges from Tuesday graded, and as you all are working in your groups, I'll call you out and give you those back. There were a couple of them that needed correction, so if you'll just look at that and make notes, uh, I would appreciate it. Also, if you would take the time to log on to D2L and make sure that you are enrolled in the correct group that you signed up with on Tuesday. If you want to change because you decide that you and your group are mutually exclusive categories at some point in the semester, you are welcome to do that and find another group and I will be happy to switch your enrollment. But we need to get started on that so that at the end, when you do your group project, this is all established and you're ready to go. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. I did want to point out one thing while I still have everybody's attention. Um, I didn't go over the syllabus. I'm not going to go over the syllabus in class because I think you can all read. But there is one thing I wanted to note on that. I list my cell phone as my, uh, my office phone. Is, I'm over in Thatcher Hall. I don't answer it. It doesn't ring very loud, and so nobody ever calls it. So use my cell phone. You are welcome to text me. I prefer texting, actually, as a method of communication. And if you would uh, think back to when Twitter was only 140 characters. I like, I like text messages, and I would prefer that you not use Twitter 280 character. Like, you know, keep it, I don't need your life story. You're not going to come to the just, I'm not going to be in class today, thanks. Um, you know, I'm sick. I don't need the gory details about how many times you, I have students every semester that tell me how many times they've thrown up in the last 24 hours. I, I don't need that. Like, you know, I'm sick. I'm not going to be there. That's fine. That's enough. 140 characters or less. Use the rule of parsing. Okay? So get in your groups and finish up that, and then we're going to have one member elect one member of your group to be a sacrificial lamb to engage in an argument with me about the answer to your critical thinking challenge. So elect one person to be your fearless leader, benevolent dictator, gracious, beloved, uh, you know, king, whatever you want to call him this day. And I will pass out the um, <coughs> great checks uh, one. All right, so let's start with Charisma. Who's your team leader? <laughs> okay, so let's make sure the video is rolling. What did you guys come up with? changing and you need to like reflect on that so you need to rely on yourself and the consumer base and craft based on that and then we said three because it can be considered a form of expression so every company and every seller is going to sell something differently even though market research in that field will be the same so like with all computer companies the market research would say this would be the best way to sell something, but each company does it differently. So it's a little bit of an art in that one. And they're all successful anyway. And that's what we said. Okay, what about is everything on a college campus an art or a science? Uh, we said, yeah, everything is. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. Oh, everything has, yep. that's not how we answer that. Okay, how did you answer that? We said that everything falls into one of each of those categories. Okay, so everything is both an art and a science. Yeah, more so. Okay. 
And so then, chemistry. So chemistry would be a science, and then like. And not an art. Well, yeah, but. Okay. All right. I'm I would. I, I am too. Um. All right. So the third question was, uh, what's the difference between art and science? I would argue that there's really not much of a difference. I'm a graphic language person. You need science to make art, and you need art to make science. So okay. So that's an interesting that's argument. Yeah. All right. I think it's correct, by the way. I think that is the correct yeah. argument. All right. Very good. Art 
is subjective. And that's, I think that's the big word with regard to what makes something an art versus a science, is that what is beautiful, <coughs> it's what? Uh, forever and ever and ever, we said it's in the eye of the beholder. So that's the big difference, I think, is that science is objective and art is somewhat subjective. It's about what you feel in, in reaction to something and whether or not that has an emotion. So I think that's, a, that's an important point in the, in the uh, difference between the two. All right, very good. What do you all think?
And all of those three things to me are things that you kind of have to create with each individual. You can't just say this will work because there's going to be five people that maybe that didn't work for it. Okay, all right. Is everything an art or a science? Uh, we said yes. Everything kind of falls under one of those two categories. Okay. So it's either like physics is clearly science. Yes. Okay. Sociology. I would go with science. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you. I like the fact that you differentiated yourself by going in opposite order of answering the questions. That's, that's interesting. Series seven.
the art several times versus like Arby's, which you don't see commercials very much. So um, that's kind of how it's science. And also, they use like colors that are um, classified as hungry colors. So I know like red is a color that is um, scientifically proven to make your brain realize like I'm hungry. I don't really know how it all works, but um, that's kind of the science aspect. And then the art aspect is. Um, the presentation and the creation of the commercials. So you have to be creative, you have to be artistic in order to build a commercial, direct a commercial, um, do an ad. Like you can't just come up with that using like squares. Like the ads are creative, they're um, designed in a specific way to get your attention. And so then the question is everything in art or science on college campus? Uh, we said yes, because the science aspect is more of like enrollment numbers, are students learning, um, is the teaching methods effective, and then the art aspect is more of like um, the can't like the campus events that the university hosts, so why we want students to come to us. That's more artistically based, um, saying like we are going to have like we're the best, we're doing this, this is why you should come join us, which is backed by science, but it's using art to do so. What's the difference? Um, we said that science is like the brains behind the operation, so science kind of gives you like the facts, the numbers, like this is statistically proven this way, and then art you can, um, it's kind of like what you can build off of that. So again, um, art is subjective and science is measurable. Okay. So one of the things that's really interesting about what you said at the beginning was that when you see an ad, you see something several times in it. And this has actually been scientifically proven. It's called the three exposure hypothesis. In order to get people to remember something, you have to expose them to it three times. And so that is a theme that you will see in a lot of ad in good advertisement, is that they will have this idea of showing you, you know, the golden arches three times throughout the ad. There's something nice about it. It's one of the things that we know from a psychological perspective that you can keep in your brain too. It's one of the reasons why <coughs> when politicians come up with their platform, it's historically almost always based on what? Three ideas. Yeah. Right? It's the economy, health care, <coughs> and safety. Right? Because we can all remember that. We can keep that in our head. We can all remember that we want to be safe, we need health care, and it's the economy. So that's an important part. Thanks. What do you all think? You want to clap before <laughs> give him encouragement. Um, so, to for the first one, we said that uh, it's an art and a science because people are drawn to what they like, and that's the art aspect. So, like, if your business markets your your brand image is something, someone's going to like it more than someone else. So, that's the art side, and then science. Um, we said there's a lot of research that goes behind that to find out what age group uses your product or what uh, nationality uses your product, so that would be the science side of marketing. Um, and then we said that it was also both at the same time because um, art shows and science knows like what's going to happen, and the art just shows what <coughs> people would like. Um, for the, if, is college more of an art or a science? We said that college is an art because you're drawn to college because you're looking for uh, what is going to further your future. And so you're like looking at what you like. So like you pick your major because you like being a, a marketer. You like being to where like in art, you, you like painting the painting of how you feel you feel. So we said that uh, college is more of an art. And then what's the difference between art and science? We said that uh, art is appeals to your visuals and that science appeals to the facts and the numbers. Okay, so it's science appeals towards the rational brain and art appeals to the emotive, is what you're saying. Yeah, more emotional. Okay, all right, what do you all think?
it's a science because it uses quantitative data to determine market trends, so you know what to market. It's also a science because it uses quantitative data to determine uh, how well a, mar a marketing scheme is done. It's so, like if you put out a campaign, you want to see how well it's done, that's going to be the science aspect of it, the quantitative. The, uh, as far as whether they're all subject, uh, whether it's, everything is an art or a science, um, we said both and neither. So like, it can fall into just art, just science, or some of both. Okay, so there's a hybrid yeah. category there. Yeah, like sociology, marketing, sales, humanities. I feel like that has a lot of art and also a lot of science in it as well. Okay. And then uh, the third one, the difference between art and science, they kind of beat us to the punch there. We said it's subjective and objective. That was our like, differentiation between the two. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you guys think? subfield of marketing called retail anthropology and we there we there are lots of studies that show for example what is the most successful way to lay out a grocery store why is it that milk and eggs and cheese are at the back you have to walk those are things that almost everybody needs and you have to walk past everything else all the other crap to get there and if you walk past all that other stuff you're likely to do what you're going to go buy it. Why are there things at in caps at the beginning of the cash registers? Why do they have this knickknacks, tchotchkes, magazines, and things like that always right there? Because those are impulse buys. And so that's, I mean, we know this from science. It gets even more scientific when we talk about things like casinos. Everything in a casino is deliberately, scientifically thought out in order to get you to separate from your money very quickly. So why, why are there no windows in casinos? Why are there no clocks in casinos? They don't want you to know what time it is. They don't want you to know that it's getting dark. The colors, everything in a casino is well thought out. And so it, it is absolutely scientifically proven that these are the best ways of getting you to give up your money. So that's a really important 
um, observation that you made there. So I think that's really good. So I think that was definitely one of the best answers. That we had. So I have you start doing this because we're going to talk about logic and critical thinking and argumentation. So I want you to start thinking about ways to argue, and argumentation is important in marketing. So I'm going to tell you what I think the answers to these questions are. Maybe I'm not correct, and you might have an argument that you want to make. And you're welcome to see me after class and make your argument and say I'm completely all wet. Is marketing an art or a science? The vast majority of you said it's both, and that's probably right. The correct answer is that it is probably a little bit of both. There are creative aspects to marketing. Product design, things that make it aesthetically appealing are maybe inherently subjective. But yes, there is a science to marketing as well. Learning how we can most effectively reach the consumer, how to best communicate with them, are all things that we can go about in enormously scientific uh, methodology. Logistics, which is a big subfield of marketing, is probably the oldest subfield of marketing, is highly scientific, just-in-time inventory control. One of the things that we know is that we can absolutely eliminate a lot of the cost. One of the ways that Walmart does this is by having an extremely efficient logistics supply chain and getting you that product where it's just in time. It doesn't sit there. The lettuce isn't just rotting in the bin. They know about how much is going to be sold every day, and so they buy just that amount and order just that amount so that it's absolutely not going to involve as little shrink <coughs> as absolutely possible. So it is probably both. What is the difference between art and science? Well, I think a lot of you got the biggest difference is that we think of art as being inherently subjective. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, whereas science is objective. And you never hear anybody say things like, oh, you're just being totally objective, don't do that. Right? We, we tend to value objectivity. But it turns out that there are now studies in a subfield of philosophy called aesthetics that are showing that the connection between these two is perhaps more important and less of a differentiation than we have historically thought. So an age-old adage forever and ever and ever has been, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Turns out that maybe it's not in the eye of the beholder. One of the things that they started doing in these experiments in the field of aesthetics and philosophy, which is a subfield of philosophy, is they've started sitting babies down in front of screens and watching what they will stare at. And it's amazing. Children are brutally honest. And they will sit there and they will look at a symmetrical face like Denzel Washington far longer than they'll sit there and look at an asymmetrical face like Lyle Lovett. How many of you remember who Lyle Lovett is? He's this sort of half-baked country and western star that wasn't very popular. His biggest claim to fame was that in spite of the fact that he's hideously ugly, he got Julia Roberts to marry him at one point in time. But he's, he's got this really odd face that's just completely asymmetrical. And you put it, you flash it up and you watch these, uh, these studies of these children and they start crying. And Lyle Lovett's <laughs> face is, you know, projected on the screen. Whereas you, you put, put uh, Denzel Washington on there and they'll sit there and they'll look at it for a long time. When we ask people to draw scenes, what is their favorite scene? Artists. It turns out that it's almost always the same scene. And no matter what the culture is, there is a proportionality to the scene that they will paint. It's almost always pastoral. It has the same proportions between sky and land. It usually involves a water feature. And so all of these commonalities, things that we used to think were inherently subjective, it turns out that maybe they're not so subjective. And maybe what we thought of as being a truth is being revealed by science to not necessarily be so. Is everything on a college campus art or science? For the most part. But is there a third category? I think there is. Is math an art or science or is it something else? Oh, mathematicians, I've had this argument and they're wrong, will tell you that math is a science. 
but it's probably not. There is a subfield of mathematics called theoretical mathematics, and it has no basis in reality. It is pure logic, but it has no known application to the physical world. So it's purely logical, but it has no application. So pure logic may be a third category. Why is that important? Because I think as we think about these distinctions and as we think about how to market things, it becomes incredibly important to think about how we go about this in the most logical way. If you want to be successful in business and not be one of those 95% of businesses that fail within the first five years, you're going to have to use all of these tools and to the best of your ability to make sure that you're a success. So I think it's important that we think about logic and critical thinking and argumentation. And that's one of the reasons that I have you start with these exercises to do that. Well, the first two eras were not necessarily scientific. The third era is where we get marketing science developing. This is where we get the recognition in the 1960s that we can systematically study the consumer from a scientific perspective. And you start getting marketing research as an emergence and a recognition that we can really learn what is the best way of doing things. We can benchmark and determine what kinds of things will be successful in this era of marketing research. So it is, a, it is an art, but it is also a science. And the marketing era is where it really begins to become scientific. We finally move into the last era. Now, there are still lots of companies that are primarily market, uh, marketing era or companies. They do research and then they put products out there. And they don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to what's going on beyond that. The last era that we talk about is the relationship era. And it's also called the era of value co-creation. It's no longer just about, so in the beginning, we have, if I have something that's better than what came before, you're likely to buy it. Or just the fact that I have it and you still really need it. You're, you're hungry, you need the eggs from my chicken, I need the wool from your sheep because I'm cold, and so we're going to trade, we're going to barter, and that's going to be okay. In the production era, it gives way to the sales era where we have more and more choices, and so you're going to have to sell people, and then you move on to the next person trying to sell. In the marketing era, we realize that we can study what it is that you're going to like and how successful things are going to be. And now in this era, we realize that it's no longer just enough to study and give you what you want. It's about building something that we call CLV, Customer Lifetime Value. Customers have a lifetime value. It's easier, in many instances, to keep a customer than to prospect for a new customer. Prospecting is expensive. If you can get people to come back, that's going to be easier than looking for new customers. Now having said that, you may not want every customer. Some customers you may not want because they're too expensive and they're not worth having. Does Rolex want to sell a watch to every individual? No, no they don't. They don't want every customer. What does Rolex want? Exclusive. They want exclusivity. They don't want every customer. But they do try and build brand loyalty so that when people trade up their Rolex, when they go from the stainless steel to the two-tone model, they're going to buy another Rolex. They want to keep those customers. But you may not want every customer. Well, what does the era of value co-creation look like? Well, it involves what we might think of as mass customization. So we went from producing small amounts of goods to the Industrial Revolution where we produced massive amounts of goods in quantities <coughs> that were very cheap, but in sort of standardized sizes. We have, in this country, a taxonomy that was largely given to us by McDonald's with regard to food. What is that? You get a small, medium, or large. Right? That's, it's, and the idea is that everybody's going to want one of these three categories, small, medium, or large. It's one of the reasons that I hate Starbucks. I think Starbucks is the tool of the devil, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Because they have A, crappy coffee, and B, they violate the taxonomy. 
Now I go to Starbucks, I want a medium latte. You mean a grande. No, I mean a medium. Like, this has been given to us by McDonald's. Don't, I'm the customer, don't correct me. Like, medium, I want the, you know, their taxonomy makes no sense. They have something called a tall, which is not tall, it's short. Makes no sense. They have a grande, which is not grand. <laughs> and then they have a vinte. What the hell is that? <laughs> makes no sense. Tool the devil, right? We go from this idea that everything's going to fit into this pigeonhole of small, medium, and large to now recognizing that we need to probably customize things. How do we do that? What are some examples of that? How can we engage in value co creation? Well, forever and ever and ever, when I was a kid growing up, M&Ms were this hard chocolate candy. What was their slogan? What made M&Ms popular? What? Yeah, what was the slogan? Melts in your mouth, not in your hand, which I can tell you because I'm Hispanic and I have sweaty little hands, um, that if you hold them in your hands long enough, they'll melt in your hands. I, I can tell you this. I've got sweaty little hands and they'll melt in your hands. But they, they will last a lot longer than other kinds of chocolate. They were, came in the same sort of colors. There was yellow, red. I remember when red, for, first of all, there was red, and then they decided that red dye number three was highly toxic, and they had to take the red dye out of it. But they came in a cellophane package, a little brown paper package that was something like Six ounces of M&Ms, and that's how you bought M&Ms forever and ever and ever. Same colors, there was red and green and yellow and brown. And then they sort of added some more colors over the years. What can you now do with M&Ms? How can you get mass customization? You no longer have to buy M&Ms just in this little package with these standard colors. You can get all kinds of different kinds of M&Ms. You can create your own. You can put your creepy picture <laughs> on the M&M. It is creepy. It's a little creepy, so I've got a little pinched face on the picture. But hey, if that's what you really want, you can get that. You don't necessarily just have to have the colors red and yellow and green and blue and brown. You can have all kinds of stuff. So you can create them by choosing up to three colors. You can add your image or clip art. You can put your text on there for your wedding, you know, <coughs> congratulations, just married, whatever. And then, you no longer just have to accept this six ounce package of M&Ms. You can have it in all kinds of different packaging that you want. Boxes, packs, gift packs. You could have tens of M&Ms and even little bubble gum dispensers and a teddy bear for M&M's. This is mass customization. No longer have to just settle for the small, medium, and large package. It's really important. And so we can add value by doing this. Does this add value? Sure. How does it add value? It's a way to commemorate special occasions. It's a way to brand your company. When I was the vice president for a publicly traded company, we had all kinds of vendors that would come by and they would buy stuff like this. M&Ms that had their logos on it, why? It's an effective way of reminding us as a, with, re, with regard to that what? Three exposure hypothesis, what they were and who they, what they were doing and they were giving us something. They liked us, they loved us. So this is value co-creation. So now that we have decided that Marketing is both an art and science. Maybe there isn't as much of a distinction between art and science as we thought, that maybe they go hand in hand. What is it that we have to do in order to establish something as a science or as a discipline? What's the first thing that we're going to have to do? First person who can tell me, what is it what we do when we start to establish the science is going to get five points today. You have to have a hypothesis. Before then, you're going to have to have something. You're going to have to have a question. 
Okay, that's the scientific method. Before we even get to the scientific method, how are we going to establish something as a science? Yes, you have to have a problem. You have to have a problem. An idea. Okay, an idea. You have to analyze it. You have to analyze it. All right. Before all of that, we're going to have to decide something. Before we see these problems, before we can establish this one, what is it that makes biology a discipline distinct and separate from chemistry? Is it subject? Yeah. It's a purpose. It's a purpose. What makes it a subject? It has its own Okay, it has its own field. You're getting warmer. It captures warmer. I'm going to say you got the, because you said field. All right? Um, I'm going to say you got the five points because you said field. You have to establish the domain of the discipline. That's the first step. What is it that makes this distinct and unique? You could see that you could call this a field. So I'll give you the five points for that. Because you have to establish the domain. How do you establish the domain? Well, you have to define it. You have to define the domain. So what is the definition, or what is the domain of marketing? Well, marketing is a new discipline. And so we're going to have to come up with a definition of marketing. And this is not trivial. In 1935, the um, National Association of Marketing Teachers, which was the forerunner of the American Marketing Association, gave us this definition for marketing. Marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services to, from producers to consumers. Is that the extent of marketing? This class is different than every other class you have ever taken on a college campus. It is different because when you walked in the door on the first day, you were an expert in marketing. You didn't know it, but you were. When you walked into your first geometry class years and years and years ago, I wish people would throw the markers that are not good away. This one's obviously dried out. Grab a couple of these and see. When you walked into geometry years and years and years ago, you learned about triangles. That's one of the things you probably learned about. If I have a rectilinear triangle, a right angle triangle, in which this side is three, uh, let's say three inches by four inches, we know that the third side has to be what? Five inches, right? This is called what? The Pythagorean theorem. Did you know that intuitively before you had geometry? No, you didn't, right? You had to learn it. But from the day you were born, actually before you were born, people marketed to you. They have these things when someone gets pregnant, what they do for people, they have a baby shower for them. And what do they do? Celebrate. They celebrate, and what are you supposed to, I mean, they, what kind of are they get what? what kind of they're yeah, they, they tell you what, you're there. I'm going to have a boy, and so they have all blue balloons, and you show up, and you just show up at the, at the uh, baby shower empty-handed. What's the purpose of having a baby shower? Sure. Yeah, so that your friends can buy stuff for you, for your baby, <coughs> to welcome it into the world. So people were buying you stuff before you were even born <laughs> that you were going to need. 
diapers and bottles and you know blankets and clothes. And when you came into this world, you instantly started marketing yourself. <coughs> you cried. And why did you cry? You were hungry. You needed to be changed. You had needs that had to be met. And this is the way you did it. So you've done this your whole life. You didn't, you didn't need a squared plus b squared equals c squared to start marketing. You had to go to geometry to learn that. But you did this from the moment you were born. And we do it until the moment you die. In fact, after you get it, we market to you. Kind of creepy. You can now prearrange your own funeral. You can pick out your own casket, your spot in the dirt where you're going to go. You know something about marketing. So what's wrong with this definition? The, given the fact that I've said you were marketing as a baby, you were crying to tell your mom, I need food. I have a need, and it has to be met. If I don't get that need, what happens to me? You're going to die. You're going to starve to death and die. Right? You can live without food for about three weeks. You can live without water for about three days. And you can live without oxygen for about three minutes. As a baby, you're going to need more than that. And you gave your, your parents these signals that you needed this stuff, that you had a need, and that they better satisfy that need, or things weren't going to go well for anybody involved. You might not survive, and they might go to jail. So you've been marketing all this time. What's wrong with this definition, then? If, if, I, if you were marketing as a baby, what's wrong with this definition? Go ahead, yes. Business activity. Ah, that's exactly right. You get five points for today. That's exactly right. It, it's not just business activities. Your needs for food were not necessarily a business activity. You need your mom to, to feed you. That's not necessarily a business activity. So it's only focused on business activities. What else is wrong with us? <coughs> so it's only focused on business activities. What else is wrong with this definition? It's only going one way. Like it's only going one way. Oh, yeah. It's only going one way. It's only going, it's, it's a linear model that goes from the producer to the consumer. So it's just one way, and we've, do, we've acknowledged that under value co-creation, it can do what? What are the M&Ms? In order to do this M&M thing, you're going to have to do what? Become the producer. You're going to have to what? Become the producer. Yeah, you're going to have to be, take part in this production. So you're not just, you're also producing something. So there's a two-way flow here. It's only focused on producers and consumers. You were a consumer, I guess your mother was technically a producer, but we don't think of it in that limited sense, for the most part. It can also be friendships. You market yourself constantly to your friends. You want people to like you. And there may not be a production of anything other than the feelings and emotions that flow. And you may, you're marketing yourself to your friends, but that feeling that flows, it may be inherent within them. And so it's not just about producers and consumers, but you market yourself. You want people. I had you get into groups in this class. You needed other people in this class to help you. You want other people to like you. So it's more than that. In the mid-1980s, the AMA began to revise the definition of the domain of marketing. And this is the definition that they came up with. Marketing is the process of planning and executing the conception, pricing, promotion, and distribution of ideas goods and services to create exchanges that satisfy individual and organizational objectives. Now this is a better definition because it recognizes that it involves more than just producers and consumers, that it involves planning and processes and executing and stuff like that, and that it is undertaken not only by producers and consumers, but it's undertaken by individuals and organizations. And I think that's a little bit better, but it's still pretty limiting. It's still really looking at a very sort of narrow scope 
of marketing. The current version, which is in your textbook, is that marketing is an activity for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that benefit the organization or individual's customers, the organization's stakeholders, and society at large. I think that's a pretty good definition. However, what you should know for the test is that I add to that definition in that <coughs> I think the definition in order to be the best definition of marketing in the domain of marketing needs to start with marketing is a pervasive social activity. What does it mean? When you put a drop of dye into, you take a drop, you did this in chemistry or some class in, in science and you watched, you put a drop of food coloring into water, into a glass of water, and what happens after about five minutes that you put the drop of, of food coloring into the glass of water? It what? It disperses and it pervades the water. It becomes pervasive throughout the water. Marketing is like that. It's a pervasive, you cannot escape it. It is a pervasive activity. That's also how this is a different class than any other. You can, you can go your whole life and never use. It's a very useful theorem. The Pythagorean theorem is useful for a lot of stuff. But you can go your whole life, I, most of you will go your whole life and never use this in any meaningful sense of the word. Other than one of the things that we know in terms of building is that if you want things to stand up straight, you know, this right angle triangle is kind of useful in many, in many instances. But you don't, you don't use it. For those of you that want to be accountants, by the way, marketing is the only fully integrated function of the firm. For those of you that want to, you know, you're boring enough to get a degree in accounting, God help you. No, it's not a fully integrated function of the firm. Debits on the left, credits on the right. You, you, can, you can run a business without knowing that. Lots of businesses are run very successfully by people who can't do math very well. Don't need to know that. Marketing is the only fully integrated function. That should come tripping off your tongue by the time you finish. I'm out of time. We'll finish with this next time and move on. I hope you all have a great uh, Thursday and a great weekend, and I will see you again on Tuesday.